Amen. All right, guys, let's turn to the book of Titus. Book of Titus, we're going to start in chapter 2. So Titus chapter 2, we're going to be right there in verse 1. So uh, Titus is a pastoral epistle, and it is written uh, to Brother Titus, who is a pastor on the island of Crete. And uh, in the first chapter, we talked about how he's encouraging Titus, but at the same time, He's letting them know, um, I left you there because there's some problems. I need you to set some things in order. I need you to get th- some things straight. Uh, he says that uh, he got a tough job ahead of you because Cretans are always uh, liars. They are lazy and, um, and that they are evil beasts and gluttons. And uh, so he said that he needed to rebuke them sharply and, uh, and with that, to uh, bring them around to the faith, to grow them up, basically. That here they had some innate qualities from the culture around them that they'd been saved out of, but it was time not to simply say, you know, well, I'm a, I'm a good Cretan, the same as we would not aim to be good Americans, we aim to be good Christians. And the same, they shouldn't aim to be good Cretans and to fit in with the Cretans, but rather they should aim to be a Christian and to fit in with the Christians. So in chapter 2, what we're going to pick up with is kind of here where Paul begins to tell Titus what the goal is, what the expectation is. Um, sometimes when we say the goal, um, that's kind of a uh, aloof kind of uh, statement. You know, oh, you know, here's our goal, but it's not like a hard goal. You know, or even sometimes when we're setting goals, we'll purposefully set them beyond what we hope to achieve, or we'll set them too low to where it's too easy to achieve, and uh, we kind of cheapen the meaning of what it is to have a goal. But uh, what this is is not simply something where it's like, ah, this would be nice if we were able to accomplish this, but rather it truly is an expectation. So, so this is what the church should look like. And then he breaks down the four categories, okay? So we've got the older men, we've got older ladies, we've got younger ladies, and then we have our younger men. Now, it's... It's not very polite of Paul to leave out all the other genders, right? I mean, there's no expectations for the Zimzers and the, you know, the, the furries and all those. You know, I mean, he, he, he left all of those out, and that is very intolerant of him. And I'm sure God got a hold of them when he walked through the gates and, and shook them real hard and said, you left out so many people. But here, he, he's going to give all of these qualities of what it means to have a sound church, to be a mature uh, church in the Lord. So in verse 1, it says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience, and then he stops. He, he starts to talk about the older ladies at that point in verse 3. So let's talk about these old men, all right? And so our older men in the church, what they are to be uh, to the rest of us is, first off, it says that they have to be sober, right? So, so what does sober mean? Well, it's easy to say they can't be intoxicated, okay? That, that's kind of a given. Um, you know, nobody wants to pregame the church service, you know, and there's no tailgating before the sermon. But what, what does it truly mean to be sober? What does that word mean? Serious-minded, okay. Yeah, absolutely, that there's a, a serious mind, that there's thought devoted to it. So they can't be wild, You know, they can't be out-of-control guys that are just uh, led by their passions and they're flighty, and man, one moment they're over here and the next moment they're led over there, and and they're just, you know, hard to contain, and, and, you know, the pastor has to go to deacon's meeting with a whip and a chair and uh, and just try to get out of there unscathed, right? Uh, That's not the goal. Uh, What it means is that they're sober-minded, that here they have thoughtfulness, um, that they're able to reason, they're able to apply logic, they're able to calmly discuss things and be able to see things from multiple uh, angles, multiple points of view. And, uh, and then with a group of them, what the idea would be is that we come to a very reasonable, a very logical conclusion that is the best conclusion for everybody. 
not just for them, not just for their crew or their group, but what's best for everybody, that we'd come up with a very well thought out uh, plan at the end of it. So the first thing, they can't be sober. Next, they have to be reverent. So what does reverent mean? Consider it, okay. Somebody else mumbled a word. Respectful, absolutely. That's exactly what reverent is. And, and so it has this connotation of that they are respectful, um, that they're able to give respect where respect is due. So that uh, incorporates also a sense of humility. You know, to be a reverent person, you have to be humble. Because if not, you're prideful, you're not going to give nobody any respect because you want it all. You know, so you're constantly trying to put everybody else down or put them in their place, let them know their thing, you know, versus if you're truly reverent, then you have a humility about yourself, a humbleness about yourself, but then also you're able to recognize excellence or you're able to recognize authority or you're able to recognize giftings in other people. So you're very gracious to other, to other people at the same time that you're receiving grace or that you're receiving uh, respect, you're also a respecter of others. So, so they're sober, they're reverent, they're, they're able to look at things from all sides, they're able to give respect. The next word that he uses is temperate. So what does temperate mean? Even tempered, okay, yeah, that they're kind of self-controlled. They're not, they're not given to extremes. That they're, that maybe moderate uh, moderation dominates their life. They're not extreme on anything, but rather they're very much um, in the middle of things. You know, trying to see things from a good perspective, put things in their rightful order. Um, so, so that they're not uh, wildly extreme about things, okay. So uh, what are some things that we could get sidetracked on and get wildly extreme upon them? TV, okay, I like that, I like it. What about jean skirts? You got to have them. You gotta have, you, ladies, you expect to make it to heaven, you got to have at least one jean skirt in the closet. Got to, okay. <laughs> oh, you don't think you're making it? <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, but so often what will happen is we can get caught up on these, these pet issues. And we can say, this is a big deal. And if you don't agree with this, then, you know, and all, you know, everything, every conversation circles right back around to that one subject. And you go, oh, God, somebody said the magic word. Somebody said the key phrase. And now the next three hours are done with, you know. That's not how the older men are supposed to be. So they have to be self-contained. They have to be self-controlled. They have to be moderate. They can't be given to these wild extremes, you know, and, and uh, you know, did somebody say Nazi? And then that's all they're talking about for the next three hours is World War II history or something, you know, like we, we have to be able to be moderate in things and, uh, and in that allow for other people to be moderate in things as well. So we're able to look at it from all sides. We're very respectful. We're moderate. Then it says uh, sound in faith. Now, a soundness means a solidness. You know, that if something is sound, that means it's good, it's in working order, that everything's where it should be, everything's in all the places uh, that it should be, it's in good working order. But what is in good working order is their faith. So now, what's faith? Faith is believing enough to base your behavior by it. So it's not just that I know these things or that I can ascribe to these facts or that I adhere to this moral code. That's not what faith is. What faith is is that, hey, God said it, it is true, and so therefore I base my behavior off of what God said. So I live out what Scripture says, not just that I know what it says, but that it applies to my life and that here is how I'm obeying that Scripture. Here's how that Scripture is relating to my daily life. That's what faith is. So the older men should also be very mature in the faith, not just in a head knowledge, not just that they could really wipe the floor with you in Bible trivia but rather that they actually are living out the faith, that they are putting it into practice. So 
that is also the older men. Then it comes down and it says, not only sound in faith, but they also have to be sound in love. Now, this word love is the agape word for love. Agape love, and you know, you know, every preacher, anytime they start talking about love, they got to talk about the five different kinds of love and all. Um, and there's a bunch of different words for love in Greek. We only have one in English. Uh, and so we just kind of rubber stamp that over everything. You know, a guy will say, I love French fries and I love my wife, and use the exact same word, you know, to, to convey his appreciation of both. And um, here, this agape love is a a God kind of love. Uh, What I like to call it is a self-sacrificial love. All right, it's a loving something more than they love themselves, okay? So they should be sound in their agape love, that they're not self-centered, they're not selfish, they're not lovers of self, um, they're not carnal in nature, just following their, be- uh, following their belly, following their, their fleshly desires, but rather that they're able to see that there are more important things in life than them, okay? And, and guys, honestly, that is one problem that our entire society has, is that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure, lovers of money. Um, Man, we've gotten to a society that is so me first that it is sickening to where people will sacrifice their children for me. They will sacrifice their jobs for me. They will sacrifice their relationship with God upon the altar of me. And so it is really sickening to see how much people will destroy those around them um, just for a little more me. And so uh, the older men in the church not selfish, but rather that they're very self-sacrificial, okay? The last quality of these older men are that they are patient. Now, what does it mean to be patient? You able to wait a long time? Yeah, long-suffering, I like that, I like that, long-suffering, that's it. Um, when When I went to old, old Noah Webster's book to to get a good definition, it said cheerful endurance. So it's not just a um, begrudgingly holding out, you know, but rather it's actually a cheerfulness in the endurance. So, you know, um, it, it's one thing to be like, um, you know, I'm waiting in the doctor's office for an hour and the whole time I'm staring at the clock, counting the seconds, getting more bitter, trying not to explode versus actually just trying to enjoy the moment. You know, just trying to make the best out of the life that we've been given. And those heartbeats, those breaths of air that we're taking in and out, that we try to find something to be thankful for, something to be appreciative over, versus just being bitter and being selfish and self-centered and you know, becoming angry. So, so I love that he included the word cheerful in there, that it is a cheerful endurance. So you can't be some old crotchety man just mad all the time. You know, what's the doctor doing back there taking a nap? You know, what do they have to do? Go kill the cow to make a mistake? You know, we've all heard that. You know. Yeah, you know, I'd go to the grocery store, they must have run out. You know, uh, it's a cheerful endurance. You know, hey, we're thankful for this place. We're thankful that we're not having to cook. We're thankful, you know, uh, you know that we can afford to do this. We're thankful, you know, and we can always find something to be cheerful about, even while we're waiting, okay? So uh, self-sacrificial, that we are healthy in our obedience to Scripture, uh, that we're moderate, we're not given to these wild extremes, that we're sober, that we're not out of control, but rather that we're very able to control ourselves and look at, look at something from all angles and all sides. We're reverent, we're able to give respect, and we're able to be humble when people are giving us respect as well. All right. So there's our older men. Now, in verse 3, he's going to change the focus, and he's going to go on to the older ladies. So he says in verse 3, the older ladies, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women. All right, and we're going to pause there. And uh, when we get to the young women, we'll also talk about older ladies at that point as well. So the first thing that he says is reverent in their behavior. Now, you see, he includes a new word in there. When he's talking about them old dudes, he said reverent, 
but he didn't say reverent in behavior. Now, why would you think that he would include an extra word in there for the older ladies? No, nobody. Every old man is scared to say anything. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I got to go home with her. You know, I ain't doing it. All right. So this word reverent here means holy. It means separate, okay? So it's a holy behavior is what it's to be. So with the men, they're able to give respect. They're able to be humble in, in receiving respect, and they're to be able to give respect to those who are respectable. Uh, when it comes along to the ladies, it's not just a verbal thing. So there, he actually includes that it goes beyond just words, but now it's actually behavior. It actually is actions as well. You ever been around somebody who can talk a good game, but they're not going to live it out? Yeah, I can tell you all about some dieting and, and foods and stuff, and I'm, I, I'm still fat. I lost 50 pounds. I'm still fat. Y'all don't need to listen to me. You know, somebody asked me the other day, said, well, how'd you lose all that weight? And I said, no, no, go talk to somebody else. Talk to somebody that's in shape. Don't talk to me. You know, like you don't want to look like this. I'm still, I'm still a before photo. Don't know. And so, you know, it's not just a head knowledge issue, but then also we have this, we have this, uh, this thing of actually putting it into practice, you know. So it would be easy for uh, for us to um, be respectful of someone with our words, but then be very denigrating of them or very disrespectful of them in our actions and in our attitudes, wouldn't it? Yeah. Be like, yeah, you know, he, he's pretty smart for an old fart. You know, so I mean, you know, you know something, you know, ah, just don't pay no attention, you know, something, you know, and, you know, you know how your granddaddy is, you know, all that. And so you're undermining every good thing that you're saying, every good thing that you're doing, you're undermining it with your actions. And so with that, he, here he includes the behavior aspect in it as well, that it's not just words. It's not just, well, I wouldn't dare say that about your granddaddy, but you know. Uh, no, it actually is our actions as well. So it's not just words. Then he moves on past reverent, and he says, not a slanderer. Now in Scripture, the one that's known as the slanderer, over 30 times the devil is called a slanderer in Scripture, over 30 times. So here he looks at, at the older ladies, and he says, one thing they should not be is a slanderer. Now, why, what, what is it to slander? What does that mean? Yeah, to deface their character wrongly. Okay? So we have to include that or else we get into the hippy-dippy feel-good stuff, okay, that we never say a bad word, okay? If, if, if Joe is a thief, it's not slander to say Joe is a thief, okay? But if we go... Well, you know, I don't know about that old Joe. You know, you know how them whatever last names are. You know how them Murphys are. Did I just slander Joe? I just kind of halfway accused him of being a thief without ever saying it. Now, do I have any proof that Joe's a thief? Have any evidence? No. So I'm talking about something I don't know, right? So I'm talking about something I don't know to impugn the character of somebody that I don't know is guilty. Now, why would somebody do that? Why would, some, why would somebody do that? Why would, why would someone seek with no information to impugn the character of another person? Make themselves look bigger, yeah. Make them look better, yeah. Be part of the crowd, yeah. Maybe attention, I got a hot story. Y'all ain't going to believe what I got to tell. Oh, man, she'll be, she'll be the most popular lady at women's Bible study right there, won't she? Yeah, she got the juicy, got the details, you know. And so with that, uh, you know, absolutely, you know. So um, that, that's a given thing because everybody likes attention. Everybody likes a story. Everybody wants to, to feel like they're the one that people are coming to as the source. And people can really get a uh, endorphin rush off of gossip, off of slander. So now what is sad is that here what's being repeated isn't even true. It's just a story. 
It's just a slander. It's a false accusation is what it is. So it says that our older ladies, that shouldn't be them, all right? That may be something that they used to be, but once they're a Christian and once they're a Christian for a number of years, that should quickly be put in the past, okay? Then it says, not given to much wine. What does that mean? Yeah, she can't be a heavy drinker, okay? So it can't be drinking a lot and it can't be drinking frequent, okay? So it's, she, drinks, she might drink a little and she might drink a little here and there, but she definitely isn't known as a drinker, okay? So she's not given over to it. There's no addiction. There's no loss of self-control. And then much is a quantity. So she's not losing control with a quantity of wine, all right? So she's able to, uh, you know, She's able to control herself. Now, would it just be wine? Well, you know, does this only apply to wine? Like she can just get liquored up and toasted off of some beer? You know, she can just down whiskey like nobody's business. She, she can put the bubbles in the moonshine jug, just not, wit, not wine, right? So it applies to all of that, right? Okay, what about drugs? Yeah, would it apply to drugs too? Mm-hmm. Yep, so grandma can just do a little bit of drugs right? Oh, but it said not given to it, and it said not much. So is it okay? <laughs> Only... <laughs> Jamie, that's probably the best answer, all right? And, and Jamie, Jamie saw right where I was needling towards, and she just cut me off. She said, nope, just only whatever the doctor gives her. That's the only drugs granny can take. Right. And so I was needling in there, Jamie. You beat me. Okay. And so uh, then, lastly, she said, or Paul says, that they should teach what is good. All right. Now, what is good is what is right. So she should be able to teach what is right. Now, in order to teach what is right, what does she have to know? She got to know what's right. She got to know what's right. So does it say be a teacher of what grandmama said? Be a, preacher of what, be a teacher of what that preacher said on TV that time? Be a preacher of what her friend said? No, don't say none of that. It says a teacher of what's right. How does she know what's right? That's what the Word of God says. So she has to know what the Word of God says in order to be able to a teacher of what is right. Or else she's a teacher of her opinion. She's a teacher of what she de desires. She's a teacher of her own mind. She's a teacher of groupthink. She's a teacher of the local culture. But she may not be a teacher of what's right. So here the goal for our older ladies isn't just to be a source of information, but to be a source of correct information. Okay? So just because she has students, does that make her a teacher of right information? No. Now, if everybody's listening to her, does that make her trustworthy? Mm -mm. No, she has to be a teacher of what's right. But well, now, what if nobody likes to talk about it and talk to that crazy old lady because she's doing stuff different than everybody else? She, yeah, should we still listen to her? Yeah, she's a teacher of what's right. So we should judge what she has to say by the Word of God. And if she doesn't line up with the Word of God, we don't listen to her. We'll go find us another one, okay? So a teacher of what's right. And let me ask you this. All right, grandma is real wise, and she knows the Bible, and she's able to give us correct information on a 100 subjects. But on this one subject over here, you don't want to ask her that. She, she's real crazy. It, you know, she believes that if you use playing cards, you're going to hell. That's voodoo. Now we're going to listen to grandmama? Does that one issue rule out the 100 that she's an expert on? No, because what are we judging her by? Are we judging her by the one thing that she's wrong about, or are we judging her by the Word of God? Yeah. So if, she has, if she's wonderful on 100 subjects, we're going to listen to her because we have judged what she has to say by the Word of God. And then if there's one subject that, man, she still wants to talk about, ladies, cut it out. And if there's one subject that she still wants to talk about, but she don't know what the Bible has to say about it, and she's just spouting off whatever she, has, whatever she wants to say, that's where we go, we're not going to listen to her there because what she has to say doesn't line up with the Word of God. But it does not invalidate all the other things that she has to say. 
Okay? So in that, we judge what she has to say according to the Word of God. Now, um, then it moves on. So she's a teacher of what's right, and here it gives her a ministry. It gives her that she is supposed to admonish the young women. Now, what does that word admonish mean? What does that really correct? Okay, all right. But it has a mildness to it. So it's not a rebuke. A rebuke has a sharpness to it, has a directness to it. And admonish is really, it's a warning, it's a notifying of fault, it's a counsel, and it very much has this attitude of mild with it. So it would be going and, and instead of going like, hey, you're wrong and you need to fix this, but rather it's a going to a lady and saying, hey, um, you know, I just noticed this, right? This, this is a tip, this is a trick, this is a, a clue, this is something that I saw, and I just wanted to, to notify you of this, or I just wanted to see if you were aware of this, maybe you're doing this not knowing, and so it very much is a mild form of correction, okay? So if somebody comes and they immediately start jumping on your case, what's your first reaction? Yeah, immediately you get defensive, Right? Yeah, immediately it becomes, let me tell you something about you, right? All right, but if somebody comes along and, and they are offering wisdom and, and they're offering it very humbly, and it may, they may even start with, I could be wrong about this, but I just wanted to give you this advice and do with it what you want, okay? You think you're going to listen to them there? Yeah. All right, Here, here's a trick I learned a long time ago. That I, that I really like, and it comes in handy for really getting people to, to listen to you, is um, I always try to say two good things before I say the bad thing. So I may come and I may say, you know what? I think that you are a great person, and I love how you're able to, to uh, just greet people and make friends really quickly and all, and that is wonderful. But, you know, sometimes when you do this right here, then, you know, that's not the best thing. Do you think you listened to me then? Yeah, because I didn't attack you. And in fact, the first two things I said were compliments. We all like to be told how smart and pretty we are. And once I know you're a fan, oh, Lordy, welcome to the fan club. Now you get to tell me about the fan club, right? And so that's how people are. It unlocks the key to correction with praise. And we can always find something good to say about folks, right? We should be able to, unless we're just a hypercritical, negative, condescending, tear down, miserable kind of person. We can always find two good things to say about somebody, right? Yep, a few of y'all agreed. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, they are to admonish the young women. So, the older women have a ministry within the church <clears throat> towards the younger women. Now, <clears throat> this is a very important and powerful ministry because um, being a woman's hard. And having advice, having wisdom handed down is a very, very... So you get to, you know, you get to pick up off of their recipes, you get to pick up off of their homemaking skills, you get to pick up off of their gifts and their talents and their wisdom and, and, and go forward from there. You're not having to start all the way back at zero. It's a wonderful blessing. And so it gives the older ladies, are giving the younger ladies a head start. They're giving them the value of experience to help them oftentimes not make the same mistakes they made. Because I think all of us can agree that like, you know, I have no desire. You know, they always hear these dudes talk about, man, if I go back to high school, you know, if coach would have put me in the fourth quarter, you know, all that stuff. I have no desire to go back to high school. Please, no. I don't want to have to ask for permission to use the bathroom ever again. All right, it's terrible. <laughs> and, and so no desire to go back, okay? But if I could just take... The, the knowledge and the information and the understanding that I have now at 42, and if I could give that to 18-year-old Jonathan, don't you think that would improve his life? Oh, absolutely it would. Absolutely it would. Do you not do that for your children? Not you just let them learn it all for themselves, right? 
you know, they're walking around, they're crawling, and they're mumbling stuff. None of y'all got them, and we're like, you know, say dad, dad, say dad, dad. None of, that, none, none of y'all held them by the, their, their fingers and, and helped them, you know, take their first steps. None of y'all did that. You did Sharon. Me and Sharon, we're the only ones, okay? That's right. They say Nana now. That's right. And the first word has to be Nana now. That's right. And so, you know, we, we do that for our children, and we don't ever stop, do we? They don't always listen to us, but we don't ever stop giving advice, right? Now, what, what Paul is saying is you take that same motherly instinct and motherly wisdom, and you apply it to all your family in Christ in the same way. So these younger women are your daughters in Christ. So you help them too, just like you would your daughter, just like you would your grandchild, just like you would all of that. So in the same way, they're to admonish the the younger women, and it gives specific areas where they are to admonish them. These particular topics are topics for the older ladies to teach the younger women, to notify them, to warn them mildly about The first thing is to love their husbands. Mm. Now, do you see what came second? It says love their children second. Now, you think he got it out of order? No, he didn't get it out of order. Didn't get it out of order at all. And people say, well, my kids come first. You are wrong. The Bible does not teach that. You are wrong, okay? You love your husband first. Husbands, you love God, you love your wife before you love your children, okay? Because guess what? All five of them little things, they're going to go away one day. I don't have a covenant till death do us part with them. I do with my wife. So she's with me for the rest of our days together, all right? And so in that, that covenant is me and her, all right? These kids, I have an obligation. I don't have a covenant, Okay, I didn't swear in the hospital while they were being born, and I was like, you know, God is my witness. I do take this child to be... No, none of that. Mm -mm. All right, so I have an obligation to them, and I have an obligation to God on behalf of them, but I didn't make no covenant before God with them. I did with my wife. My wife did with her husband. And so the very first thing, the big priority, the number one thing when Paul starts to list off things that young women need to learn, the first thing he thought of was to love their husbands. Mm. You'd think so. Yeah, you would think that it was common sense. You know, I'm not sure that it, I'm not sure that that echoes out into society. Um, And I think everybody would say they love their husband. Um, But here, he's not just saying a, um, that they know to say that they love their husband, but rather actually how to do it, what that actually looks like. Okay. So this love of husband, when you uh, break it back, you know, and take it back into its, into its foundation, what it says is fond of a man. Got to be fond of him. You got to like that fella. All right? And sometimes you got to learn how to like him, right? So sometimes you don't like him at all, right? You know, sometimes it's hard to live with, and he can be gruff and ornery and comes in, and he don't want to talk, and, and man, all day you've been waiting to, to talk to him, and it just turns into talking at him. Right? Yep. All right, y'all quit it with the elbows, okay? But here, it is a fondness of him, all right? You started, started to break down fondness. It said, an excessive indulgence of friendliness. Wow. We talk about indulging. We talk about indulging in food. And man, it's something that's very rich. And it's something that we really uh, take pleasure in all the flavors and all of, of what it does to the palate and everything. And so we really enjoy something when we indulge into it. It says to dote upon. I said, well, that, that's not a word that we use a lot, doting. And then it moved on. And it felt it went to a word that I don't um I've never heard used, 
which is to cocker, which means to pamper. You're supposed to have to teach them how to pamper their husbands. Any of you husbands get pampered? Did you say conquer? Cocker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not conquer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And so, no, nah, it means to pamper. Okay. So that's the whole idea is this idea of pampering the husbands. I, I almost scribbled through that word when I wrote it down. Okay. And so, but, uh, but it means, you know, to, to pamper, all right? So we're to indulge, we're to dote upon, we're to um, be fond of. And then the very last word, it was to caress. And it carried a, a word with it that had in the way of a conjugal and y'all know what that means, and I'm not going to define it. So, all right. So, that's a duty for the older ladies to teach the younger ladies how to enjoy their husbands, how to be fond of them, how to dote upon them, how to pamper them, how to please them, how to all of this. That's something for the older ladies to teach the younger ladies. Now, should we just throw them a Cosmopolitan magazine and walk out? Expect them to pick it up off of MTV and rap songs. No, this is something that's supposed to come from the church. This is something that our older ladies who have been successfully married and enjoyed their marriage and ought for them to be able to pass down that knowledge to their younger sisters in Christ. Okay? So those are all things that are given as a ministry just directly to the husband um, from those older ladies teaching our younger ladies. Next comes on with love of children, which is maternal. It's a tenderness towards children. And then um, it goes on, it says, to teach them to be discreet, to be chaste, to be homemakers, to be good, and to be obedient to their husbands. Now, discreet simply means that they are to be self-controlled and separate, that Nothing else has power or authority over them, okay? So that they are discreet in it, that everybody ain't got to know everything goes on in here. Everybody ain't got to know everything about my husband. And I don't have to be on the phone for four, five, six hours a day telling everybody everything I'm doing up to the minute. Sometimes it's just us, all right? You know, it's one of those things that we live in a a culture. And uh, I remember seeing this one photo that's just been burned into my mind where um, it was a picture of, I think it was one of the marathons or something, and, and it had all of this people group of this crowd behind this runner as he's crossing the finish line, and everybody has their phone out, except for this one lady in the front row, this older lady, and she's just got a big old smile leaning on the rail, and she's actually watching it. Everybody else has a picture of it. She actually has a memory. And I think that we have a generation today who will have pictures of things we have no memory of because we were too busy taking pictures instead of making memories. Sometimes something can just be in the moment and we can just leave the phone alone. Social media ain't got to know nothing about this. Okay, it can just be us. Um, Even when you see pictures now of concerts, you know what you see? A sea of cell phones. That's all it is. You might as well listen to it on the radio and took pictures of your dash. What was the point? But that's what it is nowadays. Everybody's got pictures and videos of moments they didn't experience because they were too busy taking pictures. So, discreet. Next is chaste. This is a ceremonially consecrated term. It means clean, innocent, modest. All right? that here that there is no obscenity found in her, okay? So she is clean. She is almost like a presenting of an offering to her husband, okay? So um, she's not, um, you know, tainted by what this down here does, what that over there does, what, what TV has to say, what the video said, what, what's going on uh, with social media, with all of this kind of stuff. But rather, when he comes home to his wife, he's coming home to like a safe harbor, that it's just a special place. It's just for him. It's unique. Nobody else gets to experience this. And so it is prepared 
for him. Next, it says to be a homemaker. Now, this means that she's to be domestically inclined or that she is to be a family dweller, okay? So not necessarily a stay-at-home woman. You know, we see in Proverbs 31, she's got a lot going on. She's running businesses. She's got uh, going to the market. She's got a lot of things going on, okay? But everything she has going on, what is it dealing with? Dealing with the home. Dealing with the home. Everything that we see when we see the curses handed out in Genesis uh, chapter 3, all of the curses with the woman are domestically inclined. It's all about the family. It's all about the home. It's all about the husband. Okay? So in that, she is to be a family dweller. She dwells upon her family. Even when she's doing something else, her actual heart, her mind is upon the family. It says that she is good. She good. What does that mean, to be good? It means that she is a good thing, okay? She is beneficial. She benefits him, okay? She's profit, or I like this best. She's value added. She adds value to the home. She adds value to his life. She's not just the woman he's attached to that takes his money, makes sure the bills are paid, not just the woman who he comes home, sometimes there's food, sometimes there's not food, but rather that when he comes home, he feels like she is a valuable thing because she adds value to his life, all right? Now, notice this isn't something that the young lady is supposed to learn on her own, is it? No, where is she supposed to learn this? From the older ladies, as she learns how to be a homemaker from the older lady, she learns how to be chaste from the old lady. She learns discretion from the old lady. She learns what it means to be maternal, what it means to be a tender motherly figure from the older ladies. And here's the last one. Oh, man, y'all try not to cuss and spit when we say it, all right? Obedient to her husband. Don't, don't, don't. Say, you had me up until that one, Jonathan. Mm-hmm. Obedient to her husband. Oh, no. Now, why does it put that in there? In fact, it says obedient to their own husbands. Hmm. Now, why does it put that in there? It says that she is to be subordinate. She's subordinate. She's under his authority. Now, let me ask you. If, if God decides that there's something wrong with the Jones household and he decides that it's time to put it into action, it's time to call it to what it's be, somebody's got to be held to account, he knocks on the front door, Lindsay opens the door, what's God going to say to Lindsay? The Jonathan home? All right, he's going to deal with me. I'm responsible. I may not have done it, but I'm responsible. May not be guilty, I'm responsible. Okay, so now... If I have to, and notice what, notice what Adam did. We're in the garden, and here Adam, you know, Eve sins. She's deceived. Adam's not deceived. He knows what he's doing. God comes down. Who's he called to? Adam. And then Adam says, oh, you know, I, I heard you, but, you know, I was naked. And God says, who, who said you were naked? And then he goes, and Adam's reply is, well, you know, God, it's that woman that you gave me. You see what he just said? He said, no, you deal with her. God said, I'm dealing with you, Adam. And Adam said, no, it's her fault. Was it her fault? Yeah, it was her fault. But who was responsible? Adam. He gave Adam the authority. He gave Adam the responsibility. He gave Adam all those things, and then he held Adam responsible for what happened under his care within his dominion. So, woman said, I ain't going to obey my husband. You better. You better. All right. Now, does it ever say for the man to be a brute, for a man to be abusive, Does it ever say for a man to dominate the woman? No, he's told to dominate everything else. He's never told to dominate his wife. He's never told to be abusive, never told to to anything. He's never told, he's never instructed to say, 
Well, I'm the man, so you just submit to me. See, I ever been told that? No, he ain't ever told. Guys, that's the dumbest thing you can ever say. Don't ever say that. All right, you're supposed to lead. You're the leader. You're the number one. Now, if we get some dude and, and on his door it says manager, and he walks out, and every time he tells us to do something, he has to say, well, you will do it because I'm the manager. Is he leading? No, and he ain't going to be manager for very long, is he? Because a few folks are going to get together and say, hey, you know, I think old manager might need a trip to the, to the, uh, you know, to the hobo outside. You know, I think we might need to appeal to a higher authority. Something, get this, get this goober fired. So a good manager don't ever have to act like he's the manager, does he? He comes out of there, he says, hey, guys, all right, let's do this. This is what we got to get doing. Y'all start on this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to come back and help you guys whenever I get done with what I got to get done. And all, everybody jumps to it, and, hey, we're a team. We're working together for a common objective. And that's a good manager, isn't it? And that's a good husband, too. It's a good husband, too where it ain't coming in and you shall serve me. You and the kids exist for the benefit of me. You listen to me, I'm wise. You know, I got big hands. You have tiny woman brain. You know, no, I mean, you fixing to have a really bad marriage. Okay? Yeah, that is, that is not the way to be successful in the home, and that ain't the way to get any of this other um, love your husband, fondness, indulge, dolting, caress. You ain't getting none of that either. All right, she's trying to endure you, not indulge you. All right, she's trying not to poison your food. She ain't trying not to, she's not trying to be fond of you, okay? So in that, there's not this brutish caveman, you know, I'm the man, I'm the king of this castle, you know, all that. Man, let that stuff die, okay? If you got to start pulling that out, you've already lost. You've already failed as a husband before you ever have to start pulling that out. Okay, now, when I speak and I tell my children to do something, do I have to say, because I'm your dad? No. Why do they do it? Because I'm their dad. That's it. And because they know that when daddy talks soft, daddy's trying not to talk loud and ugly. And you obey me here so that we don't have to go to the steps where I make you obey me. All right? Now, with Lindsay, I don't have the choice of making her obey me. I'm given no provision for that in Scripture whatsoever. Can't make her do nothing. I can lead her to it. I can love her well to where she wants to do it. I can lead intelligently to where she can trust me when I say, I think this is what we need to do. And she can know that, hey, you know what? Jonathan thought about that. You know what? Um, I'm not talking about buying a bass boat while Judah needs new shoes. No, nope, we're going we're gonna to make sure all, everybody else is taken care of before Jonathan gets anything he wants. Okay? And so with that, when I say, hey, we don't have money for that, she knows, hey, we really don't have money for that. Or if I say, I, th- I think I got a little extra. I'm thinking about doing this. Then she knows, hey, you know what? He's looked ahead. He's planned. He knows what the finances are. And so if he wants to do that, I can trust them. Yep, I think that's a good idea. I think we can do that. So we lead in such a way that it's very easy to, for her to follow. Like she would have to be just wildly rebellious in order not to follow a, a good husband who's a good leader and a good thought, uh, a good thinker. All right, and y'all have talked way too much. I didn't get through none of this, okay? So, all right, so we got through our old men, old ladies, young ladies. Next time, we'll come back in for our young men and our bond servants, and then we'll be done with uh, chapter two. So, anybody have a question? Yes, ma'am.
That's right. That is. That's great. Thank you, Miss Dana. Yep. It does a good job. All right. Oh, look at there. So we're close to Valentine's Day, but he didn't even have to do that. He just had to throw it in there, didn't he? Yeah. Oh. All right, guys. Anybody else? All right. Well, if not, we'll uh we'll pray our way out of here. Brother Chris Jacobs, will you close us in prayer?